Hello and welcome to the MHPN All Together Better Virtual Conference. The great debate. It's the last session of the conference and I'm just sitting here imagining where all the many people are sitting watching this. Are you at your dinner table? Are you in your car? Are you sitting in bed? Are you at your office? Where are you? But there you, you're part of our conference and we're great to see you. Um, and we've got a really good debate on today. Now, before we begin, I'd like to reflect on the meaning of place and the traditional owners and guys and the traditional owners in my place. It's the Bunurong people. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, I wanted to just, before we get started, thank our very professional MHPN team who put an enormous amount of effort into the conference to make everything work and the excellent technological team as well, JT, who've been making it all happen seamlessly. So we do live in a very changing technological world. I don't know about you, but often I feel like I've got technology whiplash at the moment. Just when I catch up with one thing, something new comes on. And I often think of that famous author, Thomas Friedman, who talked about us sort of living in this fast moving current, which is getting quicker and quicker. And the only way to stay stable is to keep paddling your kayak. So I am certainly paddling and, and we all live in very technological worlds these days. The other thing to say is, although we'd like to have a magic pudding, our mental health budgets are a limited resource. You know, they're not bottomless, they're not enough. And the truth is that many people in Australia can't access the mental health care that they need. And there's nothing abstract about that. It's very tough when you've got a, a teenager who's going through anxiety and can't get into the psychologist or depressed fella at his work and his, his life spinning out of control and he can't get some proper mental health help. Um, and this is... Uh, still an ongoing challenge that we have in Australia. Of course, there are many barriers, you know, stigma and affordability, but we do have the tyranny of distance in Australia. One of our presenters from today, who you'll meet, drove a 1,000 kilometres today, and um, we are a big country, and uh, so, you know, the potential there for digital techn uh, technologies, for mental health delivery is huge. The pandemic turbocharged things. You know, we were tinkering around with technology and suddenly overnight everything was technological. We couldn't do anything without our phones, without telehealth and online. Now, as a clinical GP, I'm a bit agnostic about the face-to-face -face versus online telehealth digital world of mental health. And obviously the answer is that we want both. So this is a slightly artificial debate because the real answer is we want both. But there are many pluses and many minuses for both face-to-face -face and, and digital mental health. And that's what we're going to be debating today, the pros and cons of face-to-face of -face versus digital mental health. And we've got an absolutely brilliant team, a couple of caveats and housekeeping to tell you about. First of all, these are pretty senior people that we're very lucky to have and we've allocated them to teams, but they're not necessarily, you know, taking a position for their organisation or even necessarily the position that they've been asked to argue. Um, so just keep that in mind a little bit before we, we take their arguments as, as quotes from them. And, you know, this debate is really a device to get the conversation going. We're going to find out what, are the views of the audience before our debaters with their great persuasiveness speak to you and after our debaters have spoken to you. And to do that, we're going to do a little poll. So what's going to happen? We're going to have a poll. I'm going to get you to commit to if we had more funding, would you be pushing it towards the face-to-face -face mental health direction or the digital mental health direction. So try and land on one of those and we want to get your vote um, and so we can compare that before and after the debate. 
You'll be hearing from our six speakers, eight minutes talking for each person and a summary from their leader. So we're going to now open up our poll and uh, we're going to get you to click. Are you a techno fan or a face-to-face -face fan? So I'll hand over to our digital friends to set that in motion. Thank you. It's great to see all these votes coming in. And we've got some lovely background music, like a game show. It's really adding to the ambiance. So while we're just waiting for our, our uh, pollsters uh, to come back to us with some early, early um, results, I I'm feeling a li little bit like I'm Anthony Green. I secretly want to be Anthony Green, that fellow that they pull out during the uh, voting every year. I don't know what happens to him when there's no elections, but they seem to just pull him out. So I'm going to be your Anthony Green person now and let's have a look at our pre-poll emily oh that's good we've got a really good spread today we've got uh, about 42 percent going for digital mental health before the debate and about 58 percent want more face-to-face -face mental health services all right so our, our digital mental health people have got a little bit of a hill to climb but that's good. At least it's a nice split. So that's excellent. So let's meet our wonderful debaters. And um, I'm going to start off first by introducing you to the lead debater from our face-to-face -face team. This is Associate Professor Matt Coleman. Now, we've got such... Fantastic people in our debate. We could spend the whole debate just reading their bios. So I'll leave it to you to look at the, his bio. But I'll tell you what I do know about Matt. He's a rural general psychiatrist. He's just finished two terms with the National Mental Health Commission. And he's also a sheep farmer, I discovered in his bio. So we're really looking forward uh, to uh, hearing from Matt. And um, Matt, just before we start, could you tell us, one thing that you uh, like to do when you're not working, maybe a hobby or an interest of yours, if you do have any spare time, that is. Um, I did uh, enjoy riding horses until I got bucked, bucked off one and fractured my hip. So um, uh, that that's off the list. Okay. Well, hopefully you've recovered very well. And it was Matt who told me that he drove a 1,000 kilometres today, I think it was. So that was... Uh, very interesting. So that was great commitment to the debate, to the debate, to the face-to-face -face team. I, I like the way you uh, you've uh, put that in there. So that's great, Matt. Let's hear from the head of our other team, the digital team, and we're going to hear. We're going to meet now, Ruth Vine, Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Mental Health, highly respected advisor on critical mental health issues that have been impacting the Australian community for many years. And we're really privileged to have her and appreciative, and you can read all about her fantastic bio. Um, Ruth, can you share with us something that you like doing, hobby, interest, when you're not 
fulfilling your super busy work roles? Well, well, you know, I got to spend a bit of this afternoon digging up my ultra minute vegetable plot because it's the end of the summer, end of the summer veggie patch. So the tomatoes came out and the beans came out and, you know, the leftover spuds got thrown out as well. So that's just a little thing, but uh, what, a, what a lovely thing to be able to do on a, sun, on a sunny afternoon like we got to have this afternoon. Well, that, that sounds absolutely lovely. Beautiful. So our next presenter you're going to meet Ooh. is uh, Heather Nowak. And Heather is one of Australia's leading mental health consumer advisors. She's done some fantastic work. If you have a look at her bio, you'll be blown away. She's one of three mental health commissioners in South Australia, and she really brings a unique perspective. So thank you, Heather. And perhaps you can tell us something a little bit interesting, hobby or um, thing you like doing when you're not working, just you could share with our audience today. I really like catching up with friends um, face to face, not online. <laughs> wow! Look at this! Look at this commitment to the team. You just see yeah. what you see what you see what she's done there, don't you? You've got that. You know, it, being able like to hug, the... being able to hug someone, <laughs> and actually, yeah, it's just awesome. <laughs> oh, nice move, smooth. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Heather. Okay, back to our digital team. Not to be deterred, we're going to bring in oh, my lights gone. I'm just running around for one second because I'm at the Beyond Blue office and I need to move to make the lights work. Hold. No worries. I will have light. We're all good. iPhones are very good. Excuse me if I look at slightly ghostly for a minute till we work it out. Okay, we're over now to our next speaker, Harry Lovelock. And Harry is Director of Policy and Research at Mental Health Australia. Welcome, Harry. And can you tell us something interesting about what you like doing when you're not working? Well, I'm acting CEO at the moment, which I'm not enjoying. But I do have a lovely boat sitting in the driveway that's looking a bit forlorn because I haven't been out in it. But I know from being out in it previously, I can run a webinar from my phone out on the water. How good is that? Technology, <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> oh, very impressive. There we go. It's another strike from the technology team. They're getting, they're getting more and more sneaky. I don't know what we're going to do. But we're going to head across now to Nicholas, Professor Nicholas Proctor, Director of Uni of South Australia's Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Research and Education Group. And he's the third member of the face-to-face -face team. And can you tell us something interesting about you, Nicholas? Um, hobby, interest, something you like to do when you're not working? Uh, it's got to be those face-to-face -face moments on the beach. Just walking the beach, hearing the sounds, seeing the waves, being with someone special, that has to be it for me, beach walking. And we're blessed in South Australia with such great beaches. Thank you, Nicholas. And last but certainly not least, we're going to hear from Associate Professor Morton Rawlin. And Morton, many of you will know, he's a well-known GP. He's the chair of the GP Mental Health Standards Collaboration medical director of the Royal Flying Doctor Service in Victoria, and lots of roles. He's, he's, he's they, pretty much any GP organisation that's got, you need a leadership sort of role. Morton seems to turn up there and does a great job. Have a look at his bio. So what a team that we've got. Morton, what's something interesting that you do when you're uh, not working? I uh, read uh, military history, would you believe? <clears throat> particularly World War II. Wow, fantastic. Do you watch docos as well, or it's mainly books? And... Yeah, no, docos as well. Yep, yep. And love to travel to battlefields and things like that if I get half a chance. Right. Well, nice segue then into our little battle here that we're going to have. <laughs> Sorry about that. Bit of a dad joke for the team. But we want we to hear... Uh, we're gonna, <laughs> enter into our, our fantastic debate today. And we're gonna start 
with our group. Now, I'm working out which way to do my hands, and I've got new respect for the weather people, the weather men and weather, weather women on the news. So we're going to hear from Matt, first speaker for the face-to-face -face team. He has eight minutes, and we're very much looking forward to hear what are his arguments for the case for more, more support for face-to-face -face mental health care. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Grant. First of all, I just want to say that I'm unashamedly a ruralist, and that's the lens that I'm going to talk to from today. Um, interestingly, my presence here today is largely because the, the predominance of this debate in rural and uh, remote settings and context. So uh, I, I make no apologies, but simply this is an unfair debate. The world's biggest experiment with telehealth, predominant recently with uh, COVID, as you all know, and it, it, it evened the playing field for all of us. And there's been multiple studies, study after study across all health fields um, asking and finding the evidence around preferences for face-to-face -face versus telehealth and the clear winner has always been in those studies face-to-face -face. and Predmore et al recently in the JAMA said that uh, clearly the, the preference from people in the mental health sector was around face-to-face -face, and that really the question was understanding patient preference will help identify the the role of telehealth in the future, not the other way around. The future is not telehealth. We need to identify where it sits in patient preference or, or cons consumer preference. So it seems that there is really no debate, face-to-face -face wins, but rather a desperate attempt to keep telehealth in the, de the, in the debate despite the hype and the promises <laughs> over the last two decades. Because telehealth has not been our saviour outside of the global pandemic over the past two decades, despite all the promises and the hype. And Nicholas is going to talk to the shortfalls and the effectiveness of it um, and of telehealth. And Heather will talk to the consumer preference and experience. But I'm going to talk about the impact of telehealth on system configuration. I'm not going to dwell on the continued failings of the mental health system especially from a rural and remote perspective, because I only have eight minutes, not eight days. And those failings are well described. But rather, I'm going to talk about why is the system in rural and remote Australia and perhaps urban fringes failing, the mental health system that is. And one of the key drivers for that has been workforce maldistribution. The place of telehealth has been front and centre of our failings as the high-tech, low-cost solution to our metrocentric systems of workforce training and development and distribution. Face-to-face -face is not the fail. Face-to-face -face is not the failure within the system. It's getting the face, or more likely, more accurately, the bum in the right place at the right time in the right amounts. That's been our failure in the mental health system. And despite hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in high tech, allegedly low cost telehealth, the system's really no better than it was 20 years ago, particularly if you're in regional Australia. So don't be fooled by the opposing team's likely arguments on the availability of telehealth, because remember, accessibility is more than availability. And if we're so attuned to understanding the social determinants, hopefully as we are these days of mental health and well-being, and mental illness and well-being, we know that the, the people that are most vulnerable, those struggling in the lower socioeconomic groups in society, the less educated perhaps, the unemployed, those with disability, those not technologically literate, like, for instance, the older populate, people in the older population, or those people who have the audacity to live outside a capital city, which, by the way, is only 30% of the Australian population, who contribute more than 75% of the export uh, um, uh, earnings of Australia, and over 30%, so more than their fair share of our economic prosperity. But also, in particular, those um, people in rural and remote Australia who are also Indigenous, their access to telehealth is demonstrably poorer um, for these high-tech solutions. So the irony is, if it weren't such an irony, it would be more obviously and blatantly immoral for such a rich nation to continue on this path that more telehealth is going to solve our problems, which it hasn't in the last two decades. So once again, our system of providing the preferred delivery of mental health care, which we know following the pandemic is face to face. Our failings to adapt our systems of workforce uh, development and distribution are borne by those who, who need it most. Uh, yet have the least access to face-to-face -to -face, and they are, you know, 
pushed into um, uh, telehealth despite not having access to it. The irony is not lost on me in that our preparation for this debate when we met a couple of weeks ago, um, because I live in a rural and remote location, my internet dropped out and I missed half of the preparation. And that's because I live in an MM5 area, only 50 kilometres from a regional town. But there we go, even a rich, white, middle-aged, balding white guy is still disadvantaged because I live in rural Australia. And so it is not our solution. It is not the solution. But we love to mythologise the bush in Australia. There and Grant did that perfectly for me. And we talk about resilience of people in the bush and we've heard about the tyranny of distance. Well, um, for instance, the back of Burke, you're right, there is a tyranny of distance because it's a hell of a long bloody way from Sydney or Melbourne, but it's not terribly far from Burke. Fully supported, fully staffed, fully capable, perhaps regional people would have a fighting chance if they went, if they were supported to do face to face. So let's drop the warm and fuzzies around telehealth. The debate for telehealth is a sign of our failures. It's a sign of the failures of the mental health system across Australia. Um, and arguing uh, um, that it is well tolerated or widely available and effective compared to say nothing, uh, is just another reminder of where, where our efforts in the system are not. But being an unashamed regionalist, I'd like to end on a positive note. Because we, have, because we do have technology, uh, which will be argued by the opposing team, we need to bring workforce development, training and opportunities to regional people to enable them to provide the preferred face-to-face -face um, of mental health care that people in the community want, rather than funding metropolitan populations to provide a charitable, uncontextualised telehealth service to regional and remote people um, who um, who struggle to get the um, accessibility because of uh, connectivity problems and the like. And currently what I would describe as the digital divide opportunity cost, because we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Perhaps we should be using technology to break down the existing two-tiered system that we have in Australia in the mental health care system, where metropolitan people are afforded choice, choice of face-to-face -face or telehealth, but regional people generally are not. Perhaps in doing so, we could also reverse some of the social determinants of mental health by providing opportunity, training, employment and better, health, better mental health care in regional Australia. Our team's not anti-technology, but we want to provide a clear and honest and open debate from a lens that is not entranced by the pixelated, high-tech, low-cost excuses for our failing systems. Over to you, Ruth. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt, for very thoughtful presenter number one. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing from our digital team, their first speaker, their leader, um, and I will hand over to Dr. Ruth Fine and look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a little surprising, isn't it, that despite all of the effort that we've had over the last decade, it is only recently that there's been this explosion in, un, in, in take up of the technological stuff and one has to ask a little why, but let's just get there. Firstly, I'm, look, I just have to take a couple of seconds to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. We're all over the country. For me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Anyway, I and my colleagues will make the case, not, notwithstanding what Matt has just um, outlined, that Indeed, digital mental health services and virtual means of accessing treatment and support are cost effective, they are evidence based and they are trusted by consumers and clinicians. And they operate across a much broader continuum of care than just clinical care. They oper operate across from prevention, self-help, clinical crisis care. They provide high quality supports that increase the availability and reach. I'm not arguing with Matt that we shouldn't have available face to face, but this is a really important um, adjunct. And, and, and they also address common barriers. Now, Matt's talked a bit about geography, but there are other barriers. There's cost, there's um, stigma, language, cultural barriers, wait times, and uh, technology helps us with some of those. So I'm gonna start by presenting some facts. Um, in turn, my colleagues, um, Harry and Morton, will argue and support the above by considering perspectives from consumer and clinician respectively. And, and of course, this debate is happening 
in, in our COVID era. And I, and I think it is important to recognise that pre-COVID, there was some technology where there was uh, Medicare items in relation to rural loadings from 2017. But from 2020, the new items that were released in response to COVID um, were really embraced. And so uh, in 2021, about one third of better access treatment services were um, accounted for by telehealth and phone. Um, and it was, it was Matt, that, uh, that increase in uptake was actually seen among people in remote areas as well as metro and uh, outer metro. So I'm going to go through a few areas. I'm going to start with digital mental health. So these include things like crisis support, helplines, web chat, clinician supported online therapy, self-directed education programs and tools, moderated peer support programs. They're mostly free or low cost. They cover a whole range of things. People do not need a referral. And as we saw in COVID, they can be scaled up fantastically. So they, they, can, they can be used to complement, they can be used as an alternative. And just coming back to the Productivity Commission in uh, 2020, they estimated that around about 2 million people being treated with medication and or individual face-to-face -face therapy were probably using treatments that were more costly than may have been necessary and that their treatment needs could have been met through services that offered a lower treatment burden in terms of cost or adverse side effects or whatever. And another about half a million people would, were not getting any care and would have benefited from some low intensity care. So they recommended additional funding, sorry, Matt, additional funding to expand some of those online supported uh, treatments, noting that they were convenient, clinically effective and, and helped people to manage their mental illness. So there is this real um, potential, uh, still a growing potential for digital mental health supports to help meet the gaps um, in the availability of lower intensity services, as well as complementing usual care options like face-to-face um, -face or MBS funded services. And, 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 and to help some of that redistribution of demand and reducing pressure uh, on the broader mental health system. So we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't, I think, fail to, to grasp the metal of, of what we can achieve and some of these expansions. So in addition to digital mental health services, there's also clinician supported online treatments. And again, these have been independently evaluated. The University of Melbourne uh, recently evaluated three funded services, um, MindSpot, This Way Up, Mental Health Online. And those evaluations found that those digital mental health services can produce superior outcomes to treatment as usual, which was um, discussing issues with general practitioner, superior outcomes in many instances to pharmacological treatment in primary care, which overall have small to moderate effects, that they were cost effective in compared with usual care, um, particularly this was in relation to individuals with both depression or depression and or anxiety, and when productivity impacts were taken into consideration, they costed less and produced greater benefits. And, and by the way, many practitioners found that to be a more satisfactory way of um, delivering services. So things like 38% of MindSpot users had never previously spoken to a mental health professional. Um, another similar figure, 38%, that were accessing it from outside a major city and up to about a third of the enrolments in this way up were from regional and remote. So clinician supported um, works. And then there's digital peer support. I'm sure Heather's going to talk about peer support, but, but the ability to deliver um, recovery focused services, including um, mental health peer support, can increase access to services, it can increase prevention and help in early diagnosis, it can de-escalate um, and, and help people with their help seeking behaviours and preferences. So again, SANE has been a very active player in this. They've provided um, digital forum communities that have uh, worked as an adjunct to the mental health system providing support again to those who get and, and, and supporting to people who might be on a wait list, who might need something before that face-to-face -face, uh, service is um, operating. Uh, say in Australia's consumer and care reforms get to about almost 22,000 participants a month, about 400 new members on average over a month, and they get nearly a um, nearly quarter of a million visits in a year. So that's sort of the opportunity for moderated forums is pretty important. And just before I finish, um, Matt mentioned support for health workers. The, the Essential Network is a Commonwealth-funded uh, service provided through the Black Dog Institute. It was established because of the recognition that health workers 
would be under particular and increased pressures in the context of COVID. And that, that the 10 uh, services been able to um, reach almost 80,000 health professionals using their, their resources. It's almost 13,000 have received an assessment and, and, and support to access further services and a large number have received one-on-one. -on -one. So I could go on and on and on about the, yeah, the reach, the convenience of digital mental health programs and support and avenues for treatment. I also wish to um, emphasize that we do not see this as a panacea. I, I'm not you know, suggesting that there is not still a need. But we, so we do acknowledge that face-to-face -face has some virtues, but the opportunities for digital technology and, and that it provides in terms of scope, scale, choice, availability, too important to dismiss and probably too important even relegate to second place. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. And I don't know what people at home are thinking, but how's the calibre of this debate? We are watching a fantastic tennis match. I'm on the edge of my seat and I'm looking forward to speaker number two, Nicholas Proctor, and I'll hand over to you for the second speaker on the face-to-face -face team. And Nicholas, just click your um, mute button, unmute button. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you very much, Grant. Um, coming to you from Ghana country, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the Adelaide region, and certainly Ghana elders, past, present, and emerging. I, you know, you've, you've just got to go with face to face. I mean, face to face just has so many advantages. You know, there's something about being in the room. Um, in the same room as a person that allows them to get a better read of the moment, the mood, the vibe, and it works both ways, the better read for the person seeking assistance and, of course, the better read for the person there to help. And true connection is everything in a person's recovery journey, and it's not the kind of thing that you can plug in. Now, here's a quote from a psychologist who really highlights this um, disconnect in online. And I quote, I find it hard to build rapport. I can't control the environment. It's harder to pick up on cues. Phone consultations are the worst. And it's not healthy for me to be in front of a screen all day. Then there's the extra effort of sending links, dealing with broken links, educating around online therapy, following up on people who don't attend or couldn't get a connection. And if these are just my frustrations, I wonder what the client's experience is like. So there is something to be said about being there and being in the moment. And sometimes being there and being in the moment might mean that you can get a sneaky read of your therapist's notes. And then there's a trip to and from the therapist's venue. Now, this is a really interesting space. This is a space that's in conscious play before and after the session. There's a time that someone can use on the way to prepare for the session and then on the return journey to process and reflect on the session afterwards. Maybe it's on public transport. Maybe it's walking through some parklands. Maybe it's just quietly driving in the car. Whatever it is on the return journey, it allows you to reflect on what has happened and process it and rather than going to more screen time, going into another virtual conversation or virtual engagement. It might also mean that you get some extra time away from work. But being there means that you can judge the, out, the outfits the therapist is wearing. You have the full picture. For example, are they wearing funky novelty socks? Some say it's important in helping to get to know your therapist as a person. There is no risk of technical difficulties, delays, mute microphones, frozen or sluggish screens, power cuts, disconnection, things that happened every day when you're in the online world. Once you're in the room together, you're confident the session will happen. It will unfold. There will be a seamless connection, the opportunity for seamless connection to be made. But on the other hand, living in a technological world, the world of virtual mental health supports that you're not in the room or in the moment. You can easily get distracted. You can get distracted by your phone, your computer, email notifications. 
And so there are some boundaries here that the online world propels us towards. Boundaries that need careful consideration, thoughtful navigation. And that not navigation is around personhood, where feelings can be received and lives revealed. That needs to be preserved. It's preserved through face-to-face -face engagement. It's face-to-face -face that serves as the antidote to a technology saturated in personal and runaway world. And let me give you an example. Just recently, 2023, the Washington Post newspaper ran a really powerful story on how people share their deepest fears and darkest secrets within the safe confines of a therapeutic relationship. And increasingly, across North America, therapists in the world are sharing versions of those stories with millions of followers on TikTok. So as the online and virtual means play out even more central role in society, therapists have crossed over to more extreme places in the online world. They have taken online spaces to discuss mental health issues that they see in their clients. And many of them are now sharing video vignettes that reveal conversations they're having with their clients. So as a result of these fast moving runaway world developments, more clients are being asked to sign social media consent forms that allow therapists to use revelations to inspire their online contact and content. So the online therapist might pledge to avoid including identifying information. It's true to say that people in therapy may find their painful life experiences or troubled relationships with their parents on therapy talk. But why is all this important? Because these actions undermine true connection. And true connection is about being together, being in the present moment. True connection is not something that you can plug in. And let's face it, um, the fast pace of technology, if you put that to one side, it's not healthy either. We heard that from our little vignette a moment ago. There's way, way too much of it in our lives. So my point, my argument, and I think it's compelling for all of us, just pause for a moment and think about what we need and what our clients are really seeking. They're seeking truth and connection. So let's go for it. Face-to-face -face, face -face means you are there with the person. And if they become distressed, you can share a cup of tea together. You can share that moment, that critical moment of lived experience together, a place to learn and to lean in and listen in together. True connection comes when feelings are received and lives are revealed together. True connection is in the same room, a place where the therapist works towards a situation where the client feels felt by them. And it's also a place of less distraction. So there are compelling arguments here, really compelling arguments. We need to think about the fast moving developments Clients in the North American context are now being asked to sign online consent forms. We need to think about the technical difficulties, the disruptions, the mute microphones, power cuts. We need to think about and privilege seamless connection. Um, we also need to think about the pre and post therapy session time and bring that into conscious play. Use that time um, when we are preparing, but use that time when we are processing and reflecting on the session afterwards. So there is something to be said about being in the moment. And it's not about being on screen. It's about being truly present and having true connection. So thank you very much, everyone. Well, another terrific speaker. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm being pushed and pulled from either side of this debate with very persuasive arguments. And a nice move there, Nicholas, to get the mute button off and the connection to play up a little bit could work on uh, pushing your point. I assume that was all uh, completely by chance. Anyway, on to our next speaker. And we're looking forward to hearing from Harry Lovelock from the digital team. Over to you, Harry. Thank you, Grant. Great to be with you today. And congratulations to the Mental Health Professionals Network in pulling off this online um, extravaganza. Of so many thousands of clinicians who are all online at some point during the past couple of days for this PD event. Something that wasn't considered possible only a few years ago, but here we are. 
and it's advancing technology and increasing level of user comfort are the reasons why. Having worked myself in professional organisations for psychiatry and psychology while also working closely with many GPs and other allied health providers, I know how close to your heart face-to-face -face service delivery is. But in this modern age, we can now effectively connect with people all around the world in ways that just weren't thought possible a short time ago. These advances in technology have given us new tools to help people struggling with mental health issues. While some may argue that face-to-face -face services are the only way to effectively treat mental health problems, I believe that digital mental health services offer a unique and valuable approach that can provide equally effective and in some cases, as Ruth has pointed out, superior results. The recent National Mental Health and Wellbeing Survey found that there were 4.2 million people with a 12-month mental disorder in 2020-2021. Almost half, 47% of these saw a health professional for their mental health, which means that over half of people didn't see a health professional. And this is higher than previous survey results back in 2007. So we're going backwards on the face-to-face -face metrics. And if you think we can provide enough face-to-face -face services to meet this need, well, as Daryl Kerrigan said in the castle, I think you're dreaming. Well, we don't have specific data on why people didn't see a health professional. We know from other studies that there are a range of issues that technology can help address. Accessibility is a major one. The recent review of the Better Access Initiative showed how waiting lists are growing and access to mental health professionals deteriorating. This is worse in rural and remote areas where the review showed the disparity in utilisation by geographic divide. This, unfortunately, is mirrored by other health services funded under the MBS scheme. One of the biggest advantages of digital mental health services is that they can be accessed from anywhere in the world at any time. This is especially important for people who live in rural and remote areas where access to traditional mental health services may be limited or non-existent. And these sort of services, digital mental health services, allow people to receive the support and care they need without having to travel long distances or take time off work. This can be especially critical for people who require ongoing treatment, as they may need to attend regular therapy or counselling sessions to arrange uh, to manage their mental health. Avail affordability is another issue. Traditional mental health services can be expensive, especially if a person requires ongoing treatment. Digital mental health services can be more cost effective as they have lower overhead costs and can be accessed remotely. This can make services more accessible to people who may not have the financial means to pay for traditional face-to-face -face services. The Guardian recently reported a person with lived experience is saying finding a good psychologist or psychiatrist who belt bills and has appointments available is like hunting for unicorns while blindfolded. Then there is the convenience of these services. Digital mental health services can be far more convenient for people with busy schedules or mobility issues, as traditional mental health services often require people to take time off work or school to attend appointments. Digital mental health services can be accessed from anywhere with an internet connection, which can make it easier for people to fit mental health care into their busy schedules. And this convenience can be especially important for people who may not have access to reliable transport or live in areas with limited public transportation costs. And then there is the increasing evidence to the effectiveness of these services. Ruth has already referred to a number of uh, uh, research articles, but there are multiple studies now, too long to list in this presentation, that have shown digital mental health services can be just as effective as face-to-face -face services for treating a range of mental health concerns. And the evidence is growing, not just for online therapy, but for the value and range of other online digital supports, including things like meditation and mindfulness apps that offer guided meditations and mindfulness exercises to help managing stress and anxiety. Mood tracking apps that can help you track your mood and identify patterns and triggers. Social connection apps that can help you stay connected with loved ones, even if you can't be together in person. Cognitive behavioral therapy apps that offer CBT-based exercise and activities. And physical training apps that can help track your physical activity, which we know can help in supporting good mental health. And then of course, this is the scary part, is the increasing use of artificial intelligence. The recent CSIRO Megatrends paper showed an exponential increase in research across all major sciences on the utilisation of AI that will provide enormous opportunities to further increase and improve availability and effectiveness of digital mental health services in the future. Plus, there's also the added bonus of anonymity. Digital mental health services can offer a level of anonymity that face-to-face -face services cannot. And for many people, seeking help for mental health can be intimidating and uncomfortable making it hard for people to seek the care and support they need. 
This can be especially important for people who may have, may be hesitant to seek mental health care due to stigma, fear of and fear of judgment. And a good example is men. They can be particularly poor help seekers and find it challenging to engage in face-to-face -face therapy. But online sessions can be conducted from the privacy of a person's own home in a range of modalities that allows their trust and engagement to grow as they progress through sessions. In contrast, face-to-face -face sessions involve long wait times, travel, cost, lack of choice, and the discomfort for some of discussing highly personal issues with a comparative stranger. So in conclusion, while face-to-face -face mental health services have been the traditional form of care for many years, digital mental health services offer a unique and valuable approach that can provide equally effective and in some cases superior results. They can be more accessible, affordable, and convenient for busy people with busy schedules, have mobility issues, or living in rural areas. Furthermore, the research is showing increasingly that they can be just as effective as traditional face-to-face -face services. And finally, these services provide a level of anonymity that traditional mental health services cannot, making it easier for people to seek care and the support they need. Of course, it's important to note that digital mental health services may not be suitable for everyone, and some people may still prefer face-to-face -face services. It's essential to have a range of options available to ensure people can access the support they need. However, digital mental health services provide a valuable and effective alternative to traditional mental health services to meet the future needs of the Australian community. So thank you. Thank you very much, Harry, and another terrific speaker, and we've got a real uh, game on our hands here. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our next speaker, the final speaker from the face-to-face -face team, Heather Nowak, over to you. And um, Heather, uh, just unmute yourself there. So we've got to... Oh, sorry. These buttons yep. are all over the shop, aren't they? We've got, sorry. we've got you, we've got you back, and um, and you're ready to go. We can hear you. Yeah, but I've just lost my. Um... Can you bring me the paper, Danny? Yep. <laughs> I'm Take sorry. your time. Take yeah, your time. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're running we're running we're running ahead. Oh, good, good. good. So when you're when you're ready. Okay, so I'm coming to you from Paramount Country um, this evening. And thank you for talking about peer work, Ruth. Um, I probably won't be talking about it tonight, um, mainly because peer work really can't be done in an online environment. It's very much a face-to-face -face, um, walking with a person, and we can't really do that online. So what I wanted to talk to you about really was, you know, in the world of mental health consumers, we often refer to the saying, we may not always remember what you said, we may not always remember what you did, but we will always remember how you made us feel. And from my own recovery journey and the, and the views of the many other people I've worked with and walked alongside, it's not the what, but very much the how. Clinicians and others engaged with us that, and made us feel that was most therapeutically beneficial or not. So how people make us feel requires true connection. This means that we need to be with and able to see a whole person. And according to Bird Whistle, about 65% of social meaning is derived from nonverbal cues. So even with video options, nonverbal cues can be distorted or concealed altogether. So the online option will never allow us to have full presence to gauge a person's reaction or emotions. We also can't see if the person has on other physical health issues that might be going on for them, you know, such as hand tremors, et cetera. Um, we can make an effort to look good from the waist up and say, you know, I'm doing really well. When concealed beneath the table are our pyjamas and bed socks because the person's only actually just managed to get out of bed for the appointment. Trust is also needed in therapeutic relationships. So let's imagine a consumer online with their clinician and the connection is just suddenly lost. The person who may already be experiencing feelings of um, self-stigma is faced with thoughts of, was it my fault? Did I actually say something wrong? The busy clinician may or may not have time to call you back and you can almost guarantee that that, cons that consumer isn't going to call back to make another appointment for fear of rejection. And it can be read as, I don't matter, and they don't care. 
So mental health issues are also highly prevalent amongst people with low income. Owning a computer and having access to the internet can be a luxury and not always possible. So who is technology actually convenient for? Certainly not the person accessing services when they actually can't access them. We can't assume that using internet modalities are possible for everyone. Even attending at a library doesn't provide privacy or adequate confidentiality for conversation. Nor can we assume that everyone knows how to use these devices or even has the literacy levels to even understand the instructions. I've never used digital mental health programs as when I needed them, I was never in a headspace to be able to use them. Having poor concentration and limited motivation, it didn't help. So the other day I decided I might actually go and have a look. So the first screen was a huge big paragraph about the confidentiality and service agreement. So once I actually read through that, I got to the next section. I then started to tick through all of the sorts of issues that I was facing. And guess what? I was informed that I needed to go and see a GP or a medic, other medical professional and that the online tools may not be very helpful for me at this point in time and that I couldn't actually proceed any further. Well, I thought I was in a good headspace, but um, not anymore. So thinking about confidentiality, who wants to talk about their most private issues with family members or housemates in earshot of the conversation? In an area of illness where people can be highly anxious or sceptical, we're relying on a system that assumes privacy. I don't know who's listening on the other end or how my information is going to be recorded or who actually even has access to my data. We see headlines in the news like, more than 6 million Australian adults had personal data stolen in past year. Medibank admits personal data stolen in cyber attack. Latitude Financial has had 14 million clients' information hacked. It doesn't serve to be very reassuring when we're at a point of feeling very negative and doubtful. So, oh, sorry, just, can, I, can you pick, keep the dog quiet? Sorry about that, our house is a bit like a railway station. So um, let's look at the breadth and reach. We have the wonderful issue of no internet access at all due to living in a rural area or some rural areas. And you don't actually need to be very far away to have interrupted or no access. Here in the Adelaide Hills, I'm constantly receiving these little pop-up screens with you have low bandwidth, turn off your camera. And in fact, I had no internet access at all yesterday for reasons I was unable to actually determine. So for people using mobile devices, accessing a signal can also be really difficult. I have family members less than 20 k's from the city who can't even consistently rely on a signal. So there's also that annoying delay in transmission that happens for telehealth appointments. So I remember when I was unwell um, and I had one of these appointments, feeling like I was even more mad because the sound and the visual image were delayed and distorted. My concentration was poor and I had no, abs no idea of what I was agreeing to or not agreeing to. So having a high level of anxiety, then being faced with sitting in front of a computer, stressing over what time to click on the link and will the link work and what do I do if it doesn't, can be really nerve wracking. We've all experienced the time when we click on the link and we get Oops, something went wrong. For someone who's not travelling well, this can cause really high levels of distress and self-blaming. Then we also have the issue of having low self-esteem and having to look at yourself on the screen or the person viewing your messy house in the background because you've had no motivation to clean it up. You want to be able to change the background, but you actually don't have any idea how to go about it. Or you do manage to put something up and completely hide the truth around how you're actually doing. So I'm concerned with how I look and I'm confused because the person at the other end is out of focus or crooked on the screen. Is it them or me? How do I fix this? It's hard to concentrate on what I'm talking about with all these distractions, technical or physical. And, oh, how I wish I was in the room and not on a screen. Scripts. 
Sounds simple. I'll send you an electronic script. We're told not to open links within text or email messages from sources not well known to us. Oh, well, you get to the pharmacy and you can't find the message with the script because it's about 50 messages down on your phone. You hold the phone up to the scanner to be told, no, you have to open the link or the link doesn't seem to be working. Oh, well, back to square one. So everything just seems so hard and I already feel that I'm hopeless and useless and, yes, stuffed up again. So post-COVID, we're often hearing people comment how good it is to get back in the meeting room after being online. We're social creatures. We like to know we're not isolated and alone. If it's good enough for the bureaucrats, why should it be different for people accessing services to see others face-to-face -face with their illness actually keeps them isolated from other people? Technology options are here because they're considered to be cost and time effective, but they are but are they effective emotionally and practically for the consumer that is struggling? We need to ask ourselves though, who really pays the price for these? I believe it's the consumer. It can create stress, fear, worry, inequity, and sometimes no access at all. And where's it going to end? Artificial intelligence is rapidly encroaching our world. We could end up having a robot, an appointment with a robot. And I don't know about you, but I'm not leaving my social and emotional well-being to be assessed by a thing with no feelings at all. So true connection is everything in a person's recovery journey and it's not the kind that you plug in. Thank you very much, Heather, giving us some really in-depth experiences of, the, um, of consumers in using technologies. So our final speaker on our digital team, Morton Roland, we're looking forward to hearing from you and I'll over to you now. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging on the lands that I'm out on today. Um, We've heard from a erudite and wonderful crew but on both sides of the argument. Um, I think, and if people hear some snoring in the background, it's because it's my French bulldogs who had their dinner early so that they wouldn't disturb us. Um, the main issue, I think, is that it's horses for courses. Um, by that I mean, if you know the patient very well, as I often do, digital mental health can be really helpful. You can see somebody who is a grey nomad who's in North Queensland, whereas where I'm in uh, Victoria, um, a particular um, a particular thing that I always remember is I had one patient of mine who's a long-term patient who went to a, a funeral in England, had some really terrible post-traumatic stress brought up. He rang me and we dealt with it over the phone. But that was because I knew him very, very well. It is difficult if you don't know somebody well to find that nuance uh, in the consultation and as we all are all the clinicians around this table have been trained in the time of face to face that's not to say that face to face is the only modality we need to work out when to use digital when to use face-to-face. -face. It is great when people can't get to the doctor. Um, you know, they're, they've got fires raging around. Um, I mean, we, at the RFDS, we did a lot of work around Malakuta in the big bushfires there. Um, and we had one clinician on the ground, but 10 clinicians who were able to come in over uh, satellite phones 
and uh, satellite imagery. And that was really well accepted by the, by the population. So it has its place. Um, it was then followed up by some face-to-face -face and s quite a bit of after that face-to-face -face has gone back to um, you know, digital means of, of counselling and so forth. It also depends a little on the uh, experience of the clinician. Sometimes, as has been said, particularly by Nicholas, you know, it does take, and also Heather, it, it does take you time to notice the extra bits and pieces that are in their background. I mean, people probably are looking at the background of mine and and are saying, "What's that in the in the uh, bookshelf?" Well, it's it's a it's a statue of Legolas. Okay, so that gives you an idea that I like science fiction, um, and that's an important thing to notice. Um, in terms of where to from here, I think that there needs to be and there is becoming more standardization around the mental health digital uh, offerings. And I particularly need to know when I'm talking to somebody that that particular thing will actually suit them. And it's not going to do harm. These, uh, you know, apps and so forth, they're not diagnostic tools. As Heather said, you know, some of them are quite uh, black and white and they've got um, algorithms in them that say, you must go, do not pass go. Um, you know, it, it's terrible. You've got to see a doctor now. Um, that may or may not be the case, um, but we, we are learning. And that's the point that I think we'd like to make on our side. Clinicians need to use the tools that they have available. For some people, face-to-face -face will be the other only option. For others, it will be blended. For others, it may well be digital because that's the only thing that they can do. Um, and we have to recognise that and try and make the experience for them as good as possible in the process that they have. Generally speaking, um, we have a lot of time spent with patients and it takes time to develop a rapport. If you use the right tools, those digital apps and so forth can be really effective at giving people homework, for instance, giving them the ability to assess themselves and see how they're actually progressing. Give them ideas of what to ask you next time that they see you, um, whether that's face-to-face -face or not. I use those digital tools to help in that way as well. They are not diagnostic tools, in my opinion. They're to help us in making sure that our patients get the best possible care. As we've moved to uh, further developments in AI, I know that um, there are some programs which are said to be uh, CBT is better on AI. Um, I, I don't really believe that myself, um, but we need to keep an open mind. We actually need to do the research and find out when these things are appropriate to use and when they're not appropriate to use. We've used uh, Lifeline for 30, 40 years. It is effective at helping people in true crisis, but that then needs to be followed up with face-to-face. -face. And I think it's a duality that we need to be aware of and embrace because it's not going to go away. 
I'll give you 20 seconds there, Grant. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Morton, for your reflections on, on our debate tonight. And um, if we were in a big auditorium, I think at this point I'd be asking everyone to be clapping. So they're probably doing it at home, I'm sure. But if you listen very carefully, you may just hear them in their, their living rooms just sort of quietly clapping away. But that just the calibre of the discussion, the commitment to patients to good mental health care, um, you know, to have the quality of these people thinking about these things in our our countries are really uh, a great privilege and, and just a fantastic discussion. I think as Morton uh, said and a number of our speakers said, we know it's not all or nothing um, and a lot more work is, to, is needed to look at where it all, all lands. Um, there were so many interesting points that came up for me, and I'm sure listening at home, um, a lot of new ideas have come up for you. Uh, I was very interested in this idea of, of what happens to people on the face-to-face -face side with their sort of anticipation of their appointment and, you know, what they do beforehand when they go in afterwards. And, um, and there was some very interesting uh, um, evidence that I found Ruth presented which, you know, ultimately we're scientific as well. And if the science is telling us that people can have improvements in their lives through digital approaches, I'm very persuaded by that too. So I tell you what, as the moderator, very appropriately, I sit beautifully on the fence. Wouldn't it be interesting to see what happens with our post poll? And if you can, I believe we're going to see what the first poll results were again too. So we can sort of compare and see if we've had any any shift, any movement from this terrific debate. Um, and uh, before we do that, um, we're just going to have a sum up from uh, Matt and first of all, Matt and then Ruth about their um, summarising their team's argument. So over to you first, Matt, for a little bit of a summary and discussion for five minutes. Thank you. So first of all, thank thank you very much to Nicholas and uh, Heather for giving us really good information and advice about the, the complexities of providing mental health care and the experience of providing mental, uh, the experience of receiving mental health care and the importance of having face to face as the primary and uh, predominant way in which that uh, care is provided. And thank you also to Morton for um, uh, summarising our discussion and, and uh, somehow jumping the fence and being on the face-to-face -face side. I really appreciate it. But I, I'm coming to you from southern Yamaji country, but am I? And I'd like to acknowledge the people here, but really, am I coming from southern Yamaji country? You don't know that. Um, I could be in a call centre as part of the commodification of uh, telehealth services that inevitably we're going to see and probably one day um, there may, may even be a Matt Coleman who's an AI bot and probably, according to our um, colleagues on the opposing side, will suggest provide better and effective care than in person. So I could be anywhere and uh, uh, are providing any sort of care and not understand the context. And I think Morton's point about um, uh, the experiences of providing crisis care, particularly in um, a, a changing world with climate change <clears throat> and rural adversity, like the floods one year, drought the next, fires in the summer, biosecurity risks at other times. Context in mental health is everything. And if I'm sitting here in my call centre in some far flung place, maybe not even in Australia, uh, and I'm trying to provide care that's context specific and have no idea what it's like to be in the fires that are just down the road and the fact that your internet playing up because because of the fires, and I don't understand that, then really, am I providing mental health care or am I making it convenient to provide the sorts of things that Ruth was talking about? We've become obsessed 
with our drive towards episodes of care. And we'll hear it. We heard about the amazing amount of episodes of care and occasions of service that, that have occurred and the, the head to head trials, which suggest that it's that uh, t uh, telehealth is. Uh, tolerable and as effective, but often some of these, uh, when do we hear about the enormous amount of face-to-face -face care that's provided and the effectiveness of face-to-face -face care? It's almost like, and please, audience, don't be taken by the shiny new toy. And as I was listening to the debate, it, re it reminded me that telehealth is like the monorail of the transport system. It's the shiny new toy that will tell you and I'm thinking about the Simpsons episode that will tell you how effective people are transferred from one part of Springtown to the, to the, uh, to the next and how safe it is and how wonderful it is and it's effective as a car. Well, here it is today and perhaps here it won't be tomorrow unless we give it more oxygen and more room to move and, the, and that commodification and that obsessionality around essentially overcoming our failures that particularly in, in my sector, in the rural, regional and remote setting, our failures of being able to adequately provide face-to-face -face healthcare and the, the, um, uh, the compensation that uh, uh, telehealth will provide for our failings. My question, and it's the irony's not um, lost on me that we're talking in a mental health professional network. My question is, how much of this system, how much of telehealth is for practitioners' preferences? And that the failings of us being able to adequately distribute well-trained and capable mental health clinicians throughout Australia, and I, I'm, as a psychiatrist, I'm going to think, I'm going to talk about my own um, uh, colleagues and that 85% uh, of them uh, live in capital cities and you could probably throw a blanket over them in a single postcode in, in those uh, capital cities. Yet 30% of the Australian population lives in uh, rural and remote regions. And large Actually, that's because of the way in which our systems have organised around practitioners and around the services themselves. So rather than coming up with a shiny new toy and look over here and let's let's um, compensate for our failings and, and uh, uh, overcoming the tyranny of distance um, and the, the thousand kilometres that I drove today to be able to see um, uh, consumers that don't have access to the internet, that do need to be seen desperately, who will only come out to the front of their house to sit down and have a yarn with a mental health professional who's real, who's not pixelated, who is on their country, who does acknowledge where they live and the context in which they find themselves and who lives and breathes the same air as them and the same uh, struggles sometimes and is part of their community. So forget the shiny new toy, don't uh, don't be fooled by the limited resourcing uh, uh, question. There's opportunity costs at every turn. Stick with face to face, and uh, um, and we'll use the digital world to our advantage to provide face to face rather than the other way around. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Matt. And and um, I'll now hand over to uh, Dr. Ruth Bine uh, to summarise for the digital team. Uh, Ruth, uh, just flick on your microphone, please. Oh, Thanks. Well, it, it wasn't me. Someone else did it. But um, where, where to start? I mean, I think, I don't think anyone, and I thank, you know, all of the speakers, all of the people who participate in this, would not say face-to-face -face is, is a crucial and continuing and, you know, an important part. Where to start? But it is not a shiny new toy. In fact, digital and, and, and um, Morton mentioned Lifeline that I think celebrated a very important milestone just recently. Th those means have been around for a long time. What's changed, I think, and maybe COVID was the, was the, the sort of accelerator. It, it, what's changed is the scope, the, 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 the range and, and who uses it and how. And, Matt mentioned that is this a is this a clinician choice or a, or a user choice? I have to say it's both. I, I I I accept that many practitioners have found it much easier to sit at home and provide virtual treatment than you know go to the inpatient unit and provide 
um, inpatient care to, to those who are significantly suffering. But equally, the consumer has also exerted choice. And, and what's interesting, I think, is that the face-to-face -face side talked a lot about the problems of technology. And I'm, I'm not going to suggest that I don't have days when my why internet knocks out. But they didn't mention that for some people, accessing public transport to get to appointments, arranging for childcare, taking time off work, all of the things that actually, for those places that it suits, make actually consumer choice much better. And, and, I, and I think one of the things we've seen, uh, and again, particularly in the last few years, has been this escalation in people choosing to use different means and, and avoiding, you know, minimising wait lists and getting support while they're on a wait list. The face-to-face the, the -face people, I, I'm as optimistic as the next person, but let's not live in la-la land. And, and, and it is difficult to get enough practitioners in the right places without wait times who, who provide their services at low cost so that there's easily accessible services. We need to have blended services as, as Morton highlighted. We need to have choice. We need to accept that technology is part of our lives and use it wisely. We don't need to be, of course we need uh, protections. Heather, Heather mentioned concern about privacy and confidentiality and who else was in the room. That's why we've got standards in digital digital mental health care. It's why, it's why we, we, we need to continue to have quality and safety and oversight. It's why we need to continue to have professionalism. We, we need to continue to um, make sure people are upholding their professional standards. But boy, oh boy, let's not, let's not uh, um, have that blanket that Matt just threw over the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, thrown over our heads to think that we shouldn't be looking out, looking at what's available, looking at what's effective and letting people um, have choice. And, and I, will, I will absolutely say and agree of course, mental health needs more funding. Of course, mental health workforce needs more support. And of course, we need to keep the availability of that intense therapeutic engagement or, Heather, peer support. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you because I think that SANE's got some pretty good evidence about some online peer support. But, but I also accept intentional peer support is something that often needs a relationship and, and that intense engagement. But, oh, no, don't throw, don't throw digital away. Don't throw... Uh, virtual away, don't throw this sort of technology away, that's let us have this conference and maybe feel a little bit like we're in each other's living rooms even though we're not. So great, great discussion, but um, I think we can have it all. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful sum ups uh, from Matt Coleman and Ruth Vine. And um, it's really been an extraordinary discussion and I'm very interested if we, our tech team, could now uh, re, uh, re-survey our, our attendees and let's see where they're all at. Um, and um, but while they're doing that, that will be just going to you now. Um, I think um, what strikes me is just an extraordinary uh, opportunity we've got to have have it all as Ruth said we obviously need to keep reforming our mental health system in, in increasing our access to services and at the same time uh, you know keeping track and keeping up with the technological developments that are there it's really extraordinary to see where it's all going to land and um, at the moment uh, our poll is up and um, we should have our, our results uh, shortly. While we're uh, waiting for that to occur, um, I just wanted to particularly take this moment as this is the last session in the conference to thank JT Production who've been managing the technology for the conference because, you, as you can imagine, there's many, many moving parts, particularly in this uh, particular uh, this session where we've had uh, uh, little screens whizzing over all over the place and switching speakers, but throughout the conference and making people feel very comfortable and uh, feeling like they've been at a conference and also for the presenters, um, 
to uh, make them uh, feel part of it all. Um, also, a particular shout out and thank you uh, to the MHPN team who've been incredibly uh, committed and enthusiastic and very supportive of all their speakers um, and great attention to detail. Uh, many of us who've been involved are involved in a lot of conferences and, and you'd have to say the, um, the work that's been put in and the preparation has been absolutely wonderful and they've been all in. So I'm expecting our results to be in now and um, let's get up and have a look if there's been any shift in our, our brilliant audience out there. And um, I might do a little drum roll here on my laptop as we wait for... Oh, there's great suspense building here. <laughs> oh, something has come up, but it's a bit small. Can we make it a bit bigger perhaps? Because I can't see what it is. Oh, and, and it looks like, Ooh. looks like our face-to-face -face team of... of um, no surprise. No surprise. Now, now, hang on a minute. I, being the good researcher, could there be any confounding variables here? I mean, is it that digital type people have jumped off the conference a bit earlier because they've got so many distractions and they've jumped on no we're getting shaking heads or is it that the face-to-face -face team has has has, has made a, a quite a convincing case there or, or or is it like what matt said that that morton was a bit a bit too supportive of his, his other team there looked like he might almost cross the bench at one one point there i'm not not too sure about that i'd just like to compliment the face-to-face -face team on all those bogus technological mess ups. <laughs> I thought that I thought that was a, a terrific strategy. You know, oh sorry, my microphone and oh my connection has gone, you know, really, really a bit sneaky, but very effective. But um, you know, it's been such a good collegial conversation. And it's nice to see us all back on the same <clears throat> screen. Um, we will congratulate the face-to-face mob because I think they had a pretty significant shift there and um, it's certainly given me a lot of food for thought um, and I'm, I am a digital tech enthusiast but also very much like being back doing face-to-face -face care with my patients so I think it's something that we're all going to be continuing to grapple with um, so a really fantastic conversation um, this is, in fact, the last. Um, well, just before I, I close the conference, I just wanted to thank um, our incredible team um, who participated today. I could see a lot of work had actually gone in to those presentations. Very thoughtful. For those of you who want to publish anymore, it sounds like you've got some beautiful ready-made op-eds all set to go. Um, I think any one of you could write a very good in opinion piece, either in the lay press or in um, this is MJA Insight. There's some very well articulated arguments for both court, both ways there, and I think the debate will continue to occur. Thank you again to Matt Coleman, Nicholas Proctor, Heather Nowak, Ruth Vine, Harry Lovelock, and Morton Rowland. Applause from your living rooms. And I'd like to officially um, close the conference again with a very big thank you to the MHPN team who have put their heart and soul into making this a great conference and also to the very supportive JT production tech support crew, very professional, really made sure they left nothing to chance to try and reduce any chance of technological tech stress made it very easy for all the presenters, so thank you. So that's all from us tonight. We're, as a good GP, I'm four minutes early, and I'll give those four minutes back to you. And thank you very much for your involvement, and um, uh, have a good night.